Welcome to Best Story Wins. I'm your host, Josh Ritchie, and today I'm joined by Jason Linko, and our guest is Noah Elias, uh, who's an artist, a serial entrepreneur, and an agency owner. Noah, thanks for joining us today. How's it going? It's going really good, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thanks for being on. Uh, so Noah, you're an artist, uh, an entrepreneur, agency owner. Um, I know you have your hands in several other things. Uh, can you give our listeners uh, a bit of an overview into what all you do and how it all ties together? Yes. So uh, at 16, I started my business on a bike in Newport Beach, going door to door, hoping that I could get people to let me do a sign for them or illustration. My dad was a sign painter letter and my mom an interior designer. So uh, creativity was a big part of our uh, upbringing. And um, I loved watching them take what was in their clients and or um, the minds of the people that they worked with and making those things a reality. That fascinated me. But I definitely had that in my gut and in the way that I was wired that I loved helping people solve a need and a problem that they were trying to solve, especially with marketing and um, uh, getting a problem solved and getting known more. Like, so how can we put people and clients in the best light so that they can become more attractive and use their amazing gifts and products to, to help them. So uh, doing marketing back then was great. There was no social media. There was no desktop publishing, you know, Photoshop hadn't come out yet. Um, so everything was done by hand. And I was just, I literally hustled as a kid, got markers, got show card material and went and did signs for people and murals, et cetera. Everything was analog. Yeah, that's really cool. So it sounds like you realized pretty early that you wanted to have a career or you needed to have a career in doing something that was creative. Uh, when did it all kind of click for you that like, Hey, this is something that I can actually do and make money and kind of make, make a life or build a life on. Yeah. Uh, by the time I was 16 and the reason why I started the business and it was called Noah's art back in the day, fully clever. It was actually a boat with a bunch of animals and art materials. And, uh, I put my business card in the yearbook and, um, I knew I wanted to be a brand. I knew I wanted to be a company. Uh, I love the whole idea of like freedom, time, freedom, freedom of creativity, freedom of, of, uh, being able to call the shots and just freedom. And I love the idea of it being something new every single day. And it was all, it wasn't going to be the same, but it came out of necessity of survival. Uh, I was either going to play pro football. I was already touring in a band, but I was always, always already doing art. And so 16, 17, 18 was like that, that time frame of figuring out, you know, I'm not going to go to college. I wanted to go to art center. I went to art center. They're like, your book is killer kid. Like go get your general ed out of the way, but don't spend a fortune to do it here. So while I was in general ed down in Southern California or in orange County, uh, my, you know, my art teacher at the time walked in and saw this half finished. I scribbled all over it and signed it really quick. And he like looked at it and he goes, now that's art. And I'm like, I'm out. Like, so that day I knew college wasn't a path in order for me to do what I wanted to do, instead of looking to get permission, hoping to get approval and hoping to get permission from like even a college and a white piece of paper, I realize there's clients waiting for me to do their work in my car. I need to get out of here as fast as possible. I already have low hanging fruit. I need to survive. I need to be, build a business. And that's when I'm like, I, I, I just like went and got an industrial unit grabbed a drop cloth, taped it to the ceiling, stapled it to the ceiling, slept in a sleeping bag, was basically homeless for 20 years. But I put every single dime, every single bit of effort into building a company. And um, I'm glad I did. But it was definitely out of survival. But there was an aspect of, I think, for any entrepreneur to prove to themselves that they can do it. And they just are like, I know and I want to build a company. And that's most of the time why entrepreneurs do something is they want to prove that they can do it. And they also want to learn something. I wanted to learn. I wanted to prove. And so that was kind of like a self-imposed um, reason as to why I did why I did what I did. But later on, that bit me and you'll hear about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, on that note, this is as good a time as any. Uh, so for listeners out there, Noah and I are good friends. Um, and so I've heard him speak on this quite a bit over the years, but for our listeners sake, no, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, just at what point in your life did you realize that, uh, there was more to life than just kind of making money and, and building a business. Uh, I know there was a turning point for you. And before we get too deep into this interview, I'd love for you to just kind of 
unpack that a bit. And, and I think that'll serve as a really good jumping off point for some of the other questions that we have. For sure. And I appreciate that. It's, um, by the time I was 28, I'd been doing it, gosh, a lot of years and I was burnt out and, and burnt out from the standpoint of, I was terrified and found myself at 28 years old. I was, I was crying my eyes out one night, went down to the beach, sat above the beach where I grew up. And I was sitting there crying out to God, praying and just saying, you know, I know I gave my life to you when I was nine, but here I am 28 years old, terrified with the ability to create anything, an agency, art publishing, you name it, licensing. And I was at the top of the ladder of success, realizing it was built up against the wrong building of self, self-promotion, dreams, ambitions, self-preservation. Oh crap. I hope I can make money. And then once I proved I can make money, I got to keep all that I can and afraid that I don't lose it. Have no idea how to grow it. Um, just living a life in fear. And, and it basically became where I became a, con I, a consumer of the blessing of, of God. Uh, I became a controller, not a distributor. I also wanted to have a very stable marriage. I wanted to have a, a, a really solid family. And so I had this, you know, visual in my mind that if I could just get this under control, if I could just get life predictable, secure, stable, I will have cracked the code. But that night was the night I went all in with the Lord. And I said, you know, I retire myself. I'm cutting myself open. I'm going to bleed out and pray for the blood transfusion of God to take over my business, take over my mind, body, soul, spirit, everything. I, I cashed all in. And I had made relationships my number one trophy of like an idol. So my business was my false idol and my adulterous affair from God and any person I was with in life. And then I made... um so my business was adulterous affair, but then I made uh, relationships my um, idol in terms of projects. And the more, the bigger issues that I could work on, anything but me. And that's when I came to the end of myself at 28 was I ran out of projects to work on. I ran out of con things to conquer. Money was no longer an issue. Bills were paid. And I was terrified about the fact that I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And I was purposeless, though I was a believer. I was busy, but no fruit. I was productive, but not fulfilled. Um, and I was successful with no significance. And that was the tipping point when really everything changed. God brought Chantel into my life. My business became a cause. And that's when we went all chips in. The short version. <laughs> so when you, so when you say, um, your your business became a cause and and you kind of found it sounds like you had been kind of on this journey of thinking you needed to do these things and accomplish these things to be fulfilled in life and then it sounds like you went through this process of like it kind of some transformation within that then got you focused on impact you could make outside of yourself um, how, how has that shown up in your business? I, you know, you've continued to do creative work as, as your career. Uh, how, how does that, how have you turned your business into a purpose? Yeah. So going from a company to a cause, uh, really wasn't about God asking me to stop doing what I was doing. It was more about where am I facing the end of the pipeline and what target is it aimed at? And for the longest time, it was me being a consumer. And it wasn't just a consumer. Like you literally can spend this life. You can waste this life. You can invest this life. And I realized a majority of what I would make, I would consume. Um, we can do it with possessions. We could do it with our time. We could make content for ourselves. And what I really wanted to do was I wanted to use the company as a cause to underwrite that which is eternal. That will be not only waiting for me, but also will be paying dividends and royalty checks forever. That's a life well lived. Um, the master's program is what I teach and is a mentorship that Josh and I have both been a part of. And one of the, one of the great days for me was, um, and I kind of teach this now, it's like a paraphrased version of the topic, but you know, for each one of us guys that are on here right now and those that are listening uh, if you go to a memorial service, typically they're going to play three songs 
ends up being about 12 minutes that your entire life is going to be summarized. So these three songs, um, what I've what I've typically found in each of the memorials I've gone to, is that I've never seen the person's career in that highlight reel. Never have. But most folks will spend this entire lifetime trying to solve the riddle of their career. And I that's how I was a consumer. I was all asked, I was asking God to bless my business, but I made him a silent partner in the process. And the moment that I realized that I wanted to solve something greater than myself and find out what mattered most to God, which was loving him, loving people, making disciples through the process of what I'm doing, just aim it at the, aim it at the target. And at the end of the year, could I stand on the scale and go, how much did I, my money go to, how much did my time go to, how much did my talent go to that, which will outlive me? That got exciting. So then I started thinking about, I can afford this life, but what are those things that I can sign up for that I can't afford? Because that's actually going to require faith. And I wanted to get rich, but true rich, riches for me when it came to being a business owner, entrepreneur from creativity, wasn't about dollars just in my bank account. It was like, how could I become wealthy in that which is eternal? Oh, it's faith. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to increase in faith unless I'm st- signing up for something I can't afford. If you could afford it, there's no need for faith. Hmm. That became an interesting concept. So for us, we were in the recession. Chantel, I said, babe, if you could live life any way you want, what would it look like? She's like, oh, I'd sell my portion of my business, come home to work with our son that we found out was diagnosed with special needs autism. And my mom had stepped away or she had passed or my stepmom passed away to cancer. One house in foreclosure, we're in the recession, another one a short sale, operations simplified, the world was crumbling down and we went out partnered with Acres of Love and a new ministry that we wanted to partner with, with special needs children in in South Africa. And that was the first time I started living. Why? Because I signed us up for something that we couldn't afford, that I couldn't fix, that I couldn't solve. Only God could do it through his miracles, but he wanted to use our business and our expertise to do it. So that's when our company went from a company to a cause was, oh, we don't own this business. This isn't our money. These aren't our houses. These aren't our kids. This isn't our marriage. This spouse is on loan to me. Um, how do I convert all of these Confederate dollars and monopoly money here on earth to that which is kingdom stock? And that's when I wanted to show other families how to, to do it and become rich in that as well. So my whole life now is dedicated to, I'm still an entrepreneur, still have enterprise, still work with Disney, still have a publishing company, still write books, still build online courses, education systems, and a big agency. And, but now the, the whole thing is that is a, a, a machine to underwrite something much greater. Like before it was, I want this thing to keep laying me golden eggs. No, now it's like it deploys and it, it need, I need God to show up and rain every single day because if he doesn't, we're not able to do what we do. That's a much funner and more exciting adventure to partner with him rather than saying, I'm going to work for him or work because I feel guilty. Bull, you get you get to be invited to this grand adventure that once you say yes to Jesus, dedicate your business to him and then go into business with him. Uh, there's no better person to be in business with than the one who created me and created everything. And I just got to get out of the way from keeping it contaminated. So that's my number one job. Trust, trust and believe every single day and stay out of the flipping way. <laughs> Do you, what, what do you see as the, you, you mentioned this role of faith in your life. Um, what on a practical level, what, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in your business and, and how do you navigate that? Mm. Um, uh, one that's probably one of my favorite is I don't, uh, I've tried this in the past. I don't mark it. Whatever you self-promote, well, my good friend Shay Bynes wrote the book, Grace Over Grind. Whatever you self-promote will require you to self-sustain. Whatever you're invited to, God provides you the grace and puts the wind in the sail. So he doesn't like provide you an assignment and then good luck with that. He's like, here's the assignment and I'm giving you the grace to sustain you through it. You'll, you'll be wondering like, how the, how in the heck am I doing this 18 hour day? Like this isn't a grind. This is operating from grace. I'm operating from rest. And I was invited to this. I don't even know how I got this. Like 
people are like, you're just lucky. And it's like, no, I'm freaking awake and I'm prepared and I'm available and I'm not on a hamster wheel. I had to get off the hamster wheel. And I, I, I've been using this a lot lately, dude. Like business owners that are believers, like it's, it's, it's literally the equivalent and we're in the NFL season of walking out on that field and like I'm playing offense, then I'm playing defense, then I'm playing every single pay and I'm playing every single position and I'm running around and I'm saying, Lord, you know, throw me the ball, throw me the ball, throw me the ball. I'm gonna play. like, and then you finally come out from the sideline and it's like, Hey dude, how you feeling? And you're like, dude, I'm gassed, but I'm so pumped to be on team. God, I'm so excited to be here. I'm gonna, you're like, you're just like, you're, you graduated from the tailgate party. You graduated from the stands. Now you're actually down on the field. Now you're playing everything. And he's like, dude, here's the thing. If you continue to play like this, you will only try to win this game and maybe this game. He's like, dude, I want you to be able to play the game forever for your entire lifetime. But you won't be able to play it at this at this level of the way that you're playing right now. You're playing everywhere, all the time, everything. And you're doing it, one, you're excited, but two, you're watered down. And you're not very effective. And it's not very game winning, but you're very, very busy. But there's there's no real way to measure it. You want to get a you want to get a Super Bowl ring? Here's what it's going to require. I want you to stand right next to me. And when I have that specific play in that specific pos- position, you are going to score a touchdown and you're going to win the game. And I'm like, well, what the flip am I supposed to do now? That's what every entrepreneur says. Well, if I'm supposed to wait for the invitation, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to trust. Your heavenly father owns your business. He knows exactly what business you need. So my number one job between plays of getting called in and being invited is to stay in preparation mode of being ready in and out of season at all times. So I work life mastery. I'm working mind, body, soul, spirit. I'm working my finances, getting my team in order. I'm working my marriage, doing date night every single week. I'm doing best days with my kids. I'm working the entire program of life mastery to be ready. I play less plays. I score when I play. It's specifically designed for me. And I get to play for a very, very long time. That's what most entrepreneurs will tell you. What do you want to be able to do? I want to be able to play for a long time, to be able to call the shots, to be able to do what I do. I love it. I mean, this is why you go into being an entrepreneur because you're so excited about making and creating and launching and all that. But you got to really understand the game that you're playing. Who yeah. owns the stadium? Who owns the league, right? So hope that helps. Yeah. You you, you talk about creating and one of the things that uh, you kind of, you touched on this very briefly, but you talked about all the different uh, ventures that you're part of. Um, one thing that people might know you for is your art. You're a well-respected, well-regarded artist, prolific artist. Um, and you're one of the few people that's been able to make essentially a full-time life from doing art. I, I imagine if you didn't want to have your hands in other things, you didn't ha- you wouldn't have to, right? And I'm just curious um, because a lot of people, when they think about artists, I think they have this like romantic idea in their head is like this person like having a cigarette in their one hand and a brush in another, maybe on the street in Paris, like painting some idea, like, you know, landscape. What is it like to actually be an artist? And what do you think most people think of besides my little caricature there? What do you think most people get wrong about what it's actually, what's actually required to, to not just like create art, but to create art as a professional? Sure. Great. Uh, yeah. Good question. Uh, I just finished my book for that exact question. Uh, Cause I get asked it all the time and parents come up to me all the time with that question. Um, and the book is called The Profitable Artist, which I know is probably a title that probably gets everybody's attention, but The Profitable Artist. But the tagline is how to prove that creativity and commerce can coexist. And that's exactly it. For me, it was, I had to realize that, you know, if I was an author, would I sit and write a book and then hand it to Jason and go, hey, thanks, man. I hope you buy it. And then go rewrite that entire book page by page again, and then go try to sell that thing that I just wrote. Like, that's the reason why the print press came into business to do publishing, right? Well, they think of book publishing. The moment I became an art publisher, a publisher of art, I wanted to be able to sell art without me being present. So I first had to realize, how do I create systems and processes to duplicate my creativity where more people could enjoy it, more people could purchase it, more people could, um, it, it could be distributed. It could go around the world. It could be global. Well, you don't build a global bank 
you don't build a global brand with a garage or backyard mentality. You know, Mrs. Fields might've created something in the kitchen, but she had a much grander vision to see cookies on a global scale. That's what I did with my creativity. But there's two things that the book addresses that are the biggest, the biggest obstacles for creatives. And that's this structure and discipline, structure and discipline. Um, art might be the product, but you know what? Structure and discipline is what everybody lacks in terms of business and being an entrepreneur. I don't care if you go into Oracle, eBay, you go into the biggest, biggest companies of all structure and discipline. You can have the best product in the world, but without structure and discipline, it's never going to go to market. It's, you know, and I would say the third on the, on the third part would be self-promotion. And what I mean by self-promotion, that's basically getting known. Like, so Mrs. Fields could have the best product in the world, right? She could be the best person in the world, but she's down a back alley behind a building. Well, she did a wonderful job of taking it down that alley, back out on the street, putting up a sandwich board sign and handing out samples. Hey, try my cookie. I've got a whole dozen back here down the alley if you want to come buy it. People lack self-promotion of being able to say, listen, getting over the hump of like, I wonder what people are going to think. The fear, the shame, the criticism, the internal critic, the imposter, the, the, like all of that, like that's what the book undoes. And my other book, Fear Hunters, helps really undo that shame so that you can step into how do I solve a much greater problem using my business by asking and self-promoting. That takes discipline. That takes structure. But it's really interesting if you go beyond getting your needs met, you'll step into structure, discipline, and self-promotion, get mentors, and get really busy if you know that what you have can help heal the world and solve a problem greater than yourself. It's the fact that nobody has anything to wake up to and go solve other than themselves. So it's like, well, why would I do all that then? Why would I step into that? Why would I go promote? Why would I get disciplined? What do I have to... Like, well, that's because you haven't had the curtain pulled back as to what's possible with your business and what you can really solve with your business. The moment, if you get that, if, if you, if you get to look behind the curtain of what's possible, you wouldn't be able to sleep. You would be intoxicated. You'd be so preoccupied on what's possible that you would literally take out a machete and simplify your life and hack your time and get all that to go get it. And so that's why, you know, the profitable artist was really, how do you crack that code? How do you crack that code of stepping into that lifestyle using your creativity that artists, creatives can make an incredible income? It's just, they've got to go beyond the thinking of, it's just for me to solve my own problems. You, meant, you mentioned in, uh, when you're talking about your call, brief stint in college. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was brief, dude. <laughs> yeah, that, that he looked at it and said, like, oh, that's art. Um, I, I'm really curious. I always love thinking about this and, and hearing artists' perspective on this. Uh, but but how do you relate to, and, and especially in commercial work, I think this is always like an interesting tension between like the artist and the businessman internally, right? Uh, how, how do you think about and value true originality in your work? Like, how, how do you define that and what... Like what value do you place on that for the work that you do? Uh, this might rub a bunch of people the wrong way, but I, I don't care. Um, when it comes to originality, there's nothing new under the sun. And for the most part, everybody is influenced by something. Um, and uh, life is one big, long um, uh, treasure hunt that we're all on. And we're collecting all these different little things along the way. And that's what helps shape and craft our own recipe right? The amazing thing is this, is like, I could have Gordon Ramsay over here, Bobby Flay over here, and I could have like all these chefs around all with the same exact ingredients, but they're going to take it and with their interpretation, come up with something. But for them to say, this is my, I invented cinnamon. Like, no, you didn't. Like, it's really what you craft with all those ingredients over time. I like to use the word instead of original. I think it really boils down to who can be clever I mean, we all love watching these baking shows. It's who can be the most creative and clever with what they've all been given the same ingredients. How and what are they deciding to create with it? Listen, in life, we are 
not just as creatives, but as humans, all given the same amount of time during the week. That's an ingredient. We are all given relationships. We all do have a unique ability, a talent, let's say, for example, but we're all working with these same exact ingredients. Some decide to make masterpieces with that, with that time and that talent and that money and those people. Other people are like the race to the bottom. How can I get things as cheap as possible? Not have to deal with anybody. Walk into a party. Even if I go to a party, not have to talk to anybody. Like it's the race to the bottom of the status quo. It's literally be a parasite on earth versus giving life and making things happen. And so when it comes to creativity, I'm like, how can I use my creativity to get as clever as possible to take, example, how can I take the word of God? How can I take the truth and the hope of what Christ has done for me and get as clever as possible through products and 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 experiences and books and content and material to bring people into a beautiful beautiful adventure that they matter and that there's more and that it gets better and that it's exciting so I want to use the ingredients that I've been entrusted with to see how I can convert that to being done in a very clever way. And that's probably the most exciting thing for me to think about. Lord willing, I'll have another 30 years on this earth. And I'm like, how can I make sure that those 20 to 30 really, really matter? And I didn't just waste this life or spend it. I literally invested it and I got really clever with the creativity. I might not be the most original. I mean, I created the kid in me. That's my own intellectual property. But is it completely original? I guess you could say that, but I'm also influenced by a lot of really beautiful, amazing things along the way, all the way back to my childhood. You know, um, I think it's how we, how we convert it to being clever. Yeah, that's good. So you mentioned, you mentioned on this, uh, recording several times now, just the, the different things we've mentioned, different things you have your hands in. Um, you obviously have your IP, you are an artist, you do agency work, you have various, uh, courses and, uh, different curriculum you've developed. How do you, how do you switch off between the different things that you're overseeing or leading and how, how do in some cases working on one thing benefit working on other things? Can you speak to that a little bit? For sure. Well, there's two aspects of it. There's the business and then there's the craft. So example, I have books, I have free stuff that lead to books. Books help people start to gain trust, learn understanding and start to do life. And we start to have a dialogue together. And then I had to answer, I had to look back over 20 years ago. I had to answer the question for myself. If I ran into myself in an elevator, heard me on a stage and go, dude, I want to work with you. How can I work with you? I want to be able to answer that question. And so that was, okay, most artists sell what they make. They don't sell what they know. So in terms of a craft, I can teach through my online courses, my master classes. I have the art.school. That's a way to teach people the craft. Then there's the people that want to learn how to do the business. And so I created courses where like, I, because I had so many people saying, how do you, can I take you to lunch? Can I pick your brain? I'm like, no, <laughs> like I can't pick my brain, but um, there are ways that we can work together. And so the courses was the first way to, you know, thankfully to technology and all the new platforms that came out to duplicate and make myself omnipresent and to share my wisdom and expertise and knowledge with those <clears throat> to help them solve their own problems. Typically, I would have a creative coming in saying, help me pay my car payment, help me solve a thousand dollar problem per month or whatever. But then I had people that wanted to graduate up in terms of intensity. And that was I need, I have much more sophisticated problems. I want to, I want to learn how to make six figures in, in the art publishing business or show me how to launch a clothing brand. So then I had to answer those questions and have something for them all the way up through consulting and coaching. And now it's, I have a, a business where I also consult and coach brands and teams and organizations and influencers and celebrities. Now to answer your point, the reason why I explain that is that is a life by design. Uh, my podcast is called creating a life by design because that is really what I want to help people do with their time is create a life by design. That's based on preference. So where they reign and their unique ability of what they've been called to do. And they're just, they're just everyday Saturday. 
And the reason why is because if I'm at the top level where I'm actually in a room and I'm, and I'm, and I'm consulting and coaching and helping individuals and our teams or ministries, what's happening behind the scenes? You can serve people globally because everything's been built by design and ways that people can still work with you. Eat down to the art publishing where art is selling online, things, everything's working. It's a system. It's a process. I'm able to be where I'm at and not be toggling, like you said, right? And then it really boils down to a world-class team of people that are behind you, very small team, but world-class that are multifaceted that can run that. And that is their expertise of being able to do that very, very well. And so um, my mind isn't in two places at once. Um, I, I really spend a lot of time coaching and helping creatives with structuring their time and stewarding their time so that they can create what we call flow state. And that's deep, 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 deep work where you're working less, making more, creating higher quality content and um, you're doing what you love and having an impact on the world. That that sweet spot of that flow state, um, I don't multitask, but I am multifaceted. And I think that that hopefully the listeners that are listening to this can feel free in that because when you grow in your creativity and your entrepreneurship and your, your desire to solve more problems, to see more things, the world will try to fit you into their mold and say, you're a schizophrenic. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're multifaceted. God's wired us to have, have desires as we grow up. We see new things that we want to do. We want to embark on new things where we just have to be very strategic is to focus on that 20% of what we do that increases 80% of our outcome, but realize Today, I am not the same person I was at 28 when I was having that midlife crisis sitting on that cliff. I might have started as an artist, but God had a portfolio life approach waiting for me that if I was willing to spend some time discovering and blueprinting that with him by design, the outcomes would be extraordinary. But it, that's where this, the the uh, structure and the disciplines come into play. Yeah, that's really cool. And thanks for that note on uh, saying you're multifaceted. Uh, I'm going to use that next time. Anna gets on my, gets on me about oh, yeah. starting a new business, right? Like that's, that's right. my answer. It's not that I have ADD. Right. It's I'm multifaceted. That's right. Yeah, multifaceted. So, uh, you know that you're on a podcast called best story wins. Uh, so <laughs> curious to Am hear I? more. Dang, yeah. I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 Brand story for you is interesting, right? Because you have, as, as you just touched on, multiple projects. But maybe for the overarching story of your company, you know, when you're talking to clients, uh, how do you explain the brand story? Well, you know, that could be for your art or if you think about it in that context as well from like a personal brand or if you care to share about both, you know, curious what story you've noticed also just resonates with with uh, clients or buyers of your art? When it comes to the art, I believe that art is the memento of an experience, um, an experience exchanged with the artist and the creator. You know, we, we, we love, we might love, you know, Griff and I going to 21 pilots concert. Um, you know, the music's kind of the takeaway of a shared experience that we have as dad and daughter, you know, dates and, and going to those concerts for me. I realize that art is the postcard. It's the memento of um, an experience that we've had together with a guest. Let's take, for example, Disney. We all have we all have one thing in common. That's we love Disney. Let's say, for example, and then it's the next layer is art. But then there's like then there's this the human connection of the artist. And I want when it comes to art, I want to see, I want the guest to see themselves in the work. So whenever I've done work, I, I get jacked on helping people see themselves and get wrapped up in the story, which would make the work seem more important or matter on my wall. If I took that home, I'm like, dude, I see myself in that, right? So example, I've got Mickey and Minnie drinking coffee. You know, it's called home is life. Home is where life makes up its mind. Pluto sitting at their feet and they're having coffee in the morning. Every guest walks up and goes, that's us. And I go, Hey, I can put your name on the coffee cups and like personalize and dedicate that to you. I'm like, what? And those like literally people crying their eyes out. Well, what's the net, what's the net effect of Noah fine art? Uh, the slogan for Noah fine art is um, using creativity and story to bring hope to the world. 
So we use the winnings of Noah Fine Art and those winnings of that brand to underwrite stuff that we're doing with Acres of Love and our ministry portfolio and our multifaceted portfolio. So that's one example. When it comes to Noah Elias and the coaching um, and the mentoring and the um, consulting that I do with teams and individuals, uh, that basically is the whole idea of I help you. I I basically help anyone that I'm going to come in contact with on a personal level, help them build an eternal family legacy using their business as a mission. That's that slogan. Like if we're doing life together, I want to help you take your life and your business and help you build a legacy using your business as a mission. So that's hopefully very clear for them to understand what's going to happen there with Noah's studios at the agency work that, that we do. We, the slogan there is like, so what, what's Noah's studios all about? Oh, I just tell them we come alongside extraordinary brands and individuals and help them steward and shepherd their business. And so, yeah, we can build sites, but I, you know, sites and copywriting and funnels and do all that kind of work and branding, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I think what sets up us apart is like, I want to help you optimize your brand to go beyond just looking good, but to ultimately serve a purpose with your products. That's where, that's what sets us apart from most that um, I encounter. And so we're, we're specialized. And I think that really helps is when you realize what is it that you have to offer that nobody else offers and you really hone in and you pinpoint that it helps you really focus and, and do work that's different. And, um, that really, really helps you with your time and, and how you allocate it. All right. No. So obviously we're recording this at a time where the economy is really in flux. Uh, different people are saying we're in the middle of a recession. Certain people are saying it's not happened yet, or maybe it won't happen at all. Um, what is this uh, period of just, I wouldn't call it economic upheaval, but economic change. What, what does that mean for people like yourself, people that are professional artists and professional creatives? Yeah. Uh, well, for some people, it's going to be a, oh crap. And for others, it's going to be like, no worries. Uh, and I, I, I think it really just boils down to which economy you're on and which currency you're, that you're playing with. Uh, we, Chantel and I made decisions uh, in 2008, 2009, when we went through Operation Simplify was to get life into such a point where we were living under our means. And by doing that, we wanted to be in a position where we could work less, make more, give more, um, doing more of what we loved, um, and building God's kingdom in the process. And that again, took a life by design and is, it's very countercultural to everything that's being advertised out there right now. Because I mean, if I went off of what's going on with the news and what everybody else is measuring themselves on. Yeah, it feels like the sky is falling, right? But it always seems like the sky is falling. It's all, it's all relative to what you're using as your worldview. My worldview is a biblical worldview that says uh, my my currency is His, is God's. Um, it's eternal. I'm not here to serve money. I'm here to serve faith. So that has a different like reason why I make money. There's a different reason why I ask. Mm -hmm. There's a different pricing structure that I have. Um, there's, it's different from what I do with my time. Um, uh, I've allocated Sabbath as a non-negotiable, which then means people go, your business is going to completely crumble if you take or triple or quadruple your time off. Um, but it hasn't. Uh, we've, we've had our best year and our, the year prior was our best year and our, um, and so while, whether you want to call the lockdowns through all those periods, the Lord has continued to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just stay out of the way and we continue to like work on that currency of like how we're going to deploy it. And it's really interesting when you're on that economy versus somebody else's economy, because it's really interesting what happens in life when you realize, Oh, this house going to target these cars, like all of this is not mine. Like, and when you, when you operate, like if you get a car, a rental car, you know, you're leasing it, you're like, Oh, I'm going to take care of this a little bit better. And like, you're a little bit more aware. Right. But on the forefront of which economy that you're living on, I just got to 
take to the bank, Matthew 6, 33, which says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and I'm going to add everything else onto you. And, so, and then, you know, that comes on the heels of like, why do you worry about this? And why do you worry about the, what you're going to wear? And tomorrow, you know, a day has got enough worries of its own. Like, why are you worrying about this? And why are you tripping on that? God owns his, God owns my business. Why am I tripping on it? It's like, That'd be like me walking in. I like box groceries at the grocery store and I'm like tripping. I'm like, I hope we stay in business. Like the manager would be like, you're a kook. What are you doing tripping? Like, you know, we've got 40 stores nationwide, you know, whatever. It's like, but we do that as like kids. We walk in like sky is falling. I'm like, well, you're at the wrong store, dude. You're shopping at the wrong place. So when you have currency and you're operating on an operating system, which is my next book that I'm in the throes of is the kingdom operating system. I want people to get this hard drive in their head so that they're making decisions on their finances and their outlook on life is it's um, doesn't have to be gloom and doom. It can be super exciting and pumped. So on in, in general, what's something you think brands should be doing more of or less of, I know you have a diff, slightly different uh, take on this than some of our guests, but the, just just at a high level in a in a time of you know economic challenges for a lot of people what do you think can help brands kind of be nimble and navigate this kind of period uh smartest thing that you can ever do is plant a tree 20 years ago and the best next time is now and um brands and agencies you know mm-hmm they're kind of transactional and just because there's technology, they basically look at everything right now as like fast food. And that's exactly what it is. Podcasts included, any content included, you know, it used to be back in the day, I read this amazing study in, in, um, I don't know if it was Forbes or Inc magazine, but essentially what was going on is there was interviewing. It was either Lancome or L'Oreal. It's been a long time since this, um, but they used to be, there would be like a quarterly, you know, a fall release or a spring release or whatever. Now it's every flipping week is a brand new, like full brand release. Um, and I even, I, you know, I can't remember the name. I just watched a documentary on it, but there's, there's a clothing, there's a clothing brand that's like literally daily, forget the week. It's daily full blown rollouts, full limited. And it's just, just absolute consumerism of crazy. Right. So here's what I believe is going to happen. Um, Everybody's going to get fatigued. Everybody, everybody already is fatigued. Everybody's fatigued on social. Everybody's fatigued on products, uh, releases. We've seen it with movies, over baking, over saturation. Everything became fast food, less quality. Nothing's tangible. Nothing's experience. People are craving vinyl. People are creating an actual book on the table. People are creating an actual experience face to face with people, having a barbecue. Um, if you really want to have, if you really want to change, your brand and have it transformational and be on the shelf here for the next 20 years, better start making people feel a certain way. Um, And fear is a terrible marketing scheme because it's short lived. And so if you can go from creating fast food and fear and create high quality touch points where people feel um, less of a transaction and more a transformation, those are the only two options when it comes to a brand experience transactional or transformational. Um, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, you've heard the saying, people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Right. I would, I would, I would love to walk into the largest agencies of the world and I go, I'll tell you what, here's your challenge. I don't care how much money, I don't care how much bandwidth of processes and systems and like influence that you have at the end of the day, how do you drive people to tears? How do you make it towards unforgettable? Um, I can just tell you right now with the amount of noise and minutia that's out there right now, uh, you're going to, you're going to get forgettable really, really quick. If you're being seen every single day and we have no, nothing to look forward to scarcity is one of your greatest friends experience and a, a transformational, um, feeling is one of your greatest friends attraction rather than promotion is one of your best friends because everybody now is savvy. Everybody now understands, oh, I'm being sold to. Oh, yeah, I know what's coming behind this this wall. Oh, I know what's leading up to the next step. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And everybody's savvy now. So um, 
I'll tell you what, the brands that are going to be around here to stay are the ones that are going to be transformational and provide a feeling for folks to know that they matter, that they belong, and that they're not a commodity, that people aren't a commodity. And uh, I'm sure you guys, just as well as myself, we can spend our times on devices and or in places and with brands where you know when you're the you're when you're the transaction, you're not the transformation. Yeah, when <clears throat> when it's it, you reminded me of some recent just software experiences I've had where it's just like they they make all the little hooks for upsells and charging you more. It's just anytime you try to do almost <laughs> anything, you know, just like add add someone else to take a quick look at a, uh, you know, website that's, you know, in process or, you know, load your note taking app on a different device. Cause you got a new phone and they're just like, Oh, you're using a third device. Let's charge you more money. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like, it, it does add up to like a feeling of like you're, I, I get it. Right. Like that you need, hooks and tears for your, for your product. To, to, but there's, there's something about that experience that starts to add up to like, wow, you are like just very clever at taking more money at each touch point. But, yeah. And I would, and I would, and I would wrap it up with this is that we're, we're taking the longer road as a team, you know, cause you just because you can throw a bunch of money at ads you're going to drive traffic to a really bad offer and make a, a really great company fail quicker. And we're taking the approach that's a longer game that says, you know what? We're going to, we're going to really lead with just over, over delivering on value, blowing flipping people's minds and letting it be this attraction of discovery. And you know, that feeling like, let's say you find a guy that makes really rad journals on Instagram and you're just like, he hasn't asked for anything. He's just like sharing his heart and story and like genuinely like, and this is what I press on anybody that's listening to this. I don't care if you're a massive multi-billion dollar agency or you're down to the grassroots guy that wants to sell more wallets out of your garage. I wholeheartedly believe this is moving into the age who is going to have the balls and the courage to 100% live 100% authentic. The ballers of marketing will be who genuinely drops the fig leaf, shows the good, the bad, and the ugly, and shares more than sells. And dude, I'm, I'm the worst because you know, when you're first building the business, you're hustling and you're doing whatever you, and you're here. Oh no, you're supposed to promote. You got to build a really great company. You got to build a really great product. And then you got to go promote it. And then you're self promote, self promote, self promote. And then you're like, you're freaking selling. And then it's like, how nuanced can you get on selling? And then it's like, Oh no, I know the upsell. And here comes the tick. Here comes the, app. like remove all of that freaking noise and just go, here's my journal on display the good, the bad, the ugly. I genuinely love you. I, I genuinely care about you. And if I do, you guys are going to understand. And I'm going to, I'm going to share all aspects of my life, zits and all. Like God gave them to us so that we remain humble. But at the end of the day, nobody's genuinely being 100% authentic. It's like, can you imagine if Instagram was literally the genuine authentic self? It'd be like a freaking train wreck. But instead, it's a highlight reel of like la la land of things that don't exist. And then everybody's comparing thinking that that is actually life. And it's like, Oh, I go on there. I feel cra more crappy about what I am not rather than celebrating who I am. Good, bad, and ugly. I'm going to show everybody that. So just to kind of piggyback off that answer, um, we would, we have to ask you about AI, right? Everybody's talking about AI, obviously. Um, what do you think the proliferation of AI and creators using AI, what do you think that's going to mean for folks like yourself, for folks like us, for people that are just trying to build, trying to be authentic? Um, do you see any risk in that new technological innovation or how else would you relate to that? No, I, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have a bunch of thoughts and I, I kind of keep going back to that example. 
there's going to be people that care more about people. And then there's going to be people that care more about process. And that's really what the war is. People over process. There's going to be, you know, are you going to be stoked to go sit at this super rad 1920s place for dinner in London and have a freaking robot serve you? I'm like, well, great. You know, you kind of ruin the experience because I consider a place like that, a brick and mortar place is like, literally I'm sitting in a piece of art and I, I, I see my server as a part of the process of this beautiful experience, right? You put a robot in there and all of a sudden it kind of takes it away. Well, then you go into agency work and then you're like, oh, I've got a robot that's write, writing copy for me and everything. I'm like, yeah, it's good, but I've yet to see AI where I go, yeah, that's really, really pure and really, really good. It's, it's AI, 100 million percent. I don't even care if it's a still image. I don't care. Everything that I've seen up to this point, and do you guys even know what the term uncanny valley is? Okay. Uncanny Valley is, um, think polar express where you're like looking at these humans are like, they're still a little bit dead behind the eyes, right? Like it's just a spirit, the human spirit, it actually gets to a point where it resents it. It's too close to being humid. It's, it gives you that kind of, Ooh, kind of feeling, right? That uncanny Valley to me is in everything for the most part already, dude. Okay. What I'm getting at is there's going to be folks that are like, oh yeah, it can totally serve. Just depends on, you know, a lot of folks can stay at Courtyard Marriott. A lot of folks can stay at a Marriott. A lot of folks can go to a Ritz Carlton. They're all owned by the same brand. You just get to pick based on preference. And so for me, preference says I'd rather have stuff that's involved with like really real humans and really cool. However, there are going to be spots where it can be maximized that really helps things be more productive. And it's really awesome. Email, for example, I can put a stamp on. Do I feel like a purist because I wrote a letter and I sent it versus like, you know, I'm sending something really quick for a communication. That's one way. But let's just take a practical in terms of craft, you know, watching artists back in the day use little lenses for projections to be able to speed up their time on getting a layout done onto a canvas. That's a way. Well, projectors, technology, things graduated, printing, plotting, publishing, right? It's been around for a very, very, very long time in terms of like how it can go to work for us and really, really help us. So there's going to be times and places where I think it's a wonderful fit. Um, there's going to be other places where I think it robs a, a great opportunity for an amazing transformational experience that makes it that much more special. Um, yeah, it's just, it's called artificial for a reason. I don't like fake grass. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, I made a choice. It's a pain in the ass to take care of, but at the end of the day, put your feet on real grass, put your feet on fake grass. It's just a different, and it, it's just I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just personal preference. There's going to be some people that want to go pitch a tent and say they're camping. Other people feel better in a flipping Winnebago. It's like, but for me, AI, you know, some people thinks it's robbing things. No, it's just that you're choosing to say that it's robbing things. Like go do something else then. Give us something that we haven't seen before. And this is, by the way, this is the whole thing. And I'll, I promise I'm ending on this, but <laughs> um, most of this world is content and coming up with solutions and, and coming up with concepts and processes or whatever. It's like, we need to overturn this. This isn't right. And I'm like, how about instead of like trying to debunk everything like AI is this big threat? I'm like, how about this? How about you take out that, all that same exact energy and go create something so badass, so insanely attractive and exciting that I don't want to pick that? Like, don't try to overturn everything. Just go outshine everything with your creativity and get very clever. There's very few people doing that. And quite frankly, all everybody else is doing is just regurgitating the same old fast food and it's just making things fail quicker. Come up with something clever and very, very cool. That gets exciting. And that is harder and that might take you a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, here's, here's what everybody wants to end their life saying. I'm looking back and I'm really proud of what I made. That's how everybody wants to end. I did work that I'm really, really, really proud of. Yeah. Versus taking the easy way out, right? Um, that's good. That's an, that was an artist's answer, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, thanks for so much. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, for for.
for those that want to learn more about you and um, learn more about what you do, what you make, uh, what's the best place for them to find you online to follow you along for your journey? Thanks, dude. Uh, NoahElias.net. Um, you can go to NoahElias.net, NoahFineArt.com. And then uh, you can check me out on Instagram, Noah.j.elias, and then Noah Fine Art. Um, yeah, that's the best way. And check everything out there. We just uh, launched a bunch of new stuff online. So pretty pumped about it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank you, Noah. guys.